Well, good morning and welcome to Grace of Church for All Nations. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. Well, we're going to start off the service just encouraging you to, to know that God is on your side. He hears us when we call on his name. He is good. Sing this out. How blessed the Lord at all times and his praise will be in my mind for his word. Oh, let's magnify Can we sing that together again? I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise will be in my mouth for he's worthy. Oh, let's magnify him. Come on, let's lift it up together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We take our refuge in him. Oh, the Lord is near to the broken heart and we take our refuge in him. Our refuge is here. Our voice is in the Lord. Let's sing this together. My soul will boast in the Lord. I will see him with all of my heart. Lord, he's worthy. Oh, let's magnify him. Come on, sing it out, church. Whoa. Yeah. 
not trust the sweetest prey, but holy trust. Washing my 
statement father it can be a frightening statement it can be painful sometimes God but that's our prayer we want to be more like you no matter what that means no matter what that looks like come and move in this place today Holy Spirit you're welcome here help us see the things that we need to shed and get rid of God 
Let our lives be a light that shines brightly for you, bringing you glory, God, so that the world may see and want to know the hope that we have. And we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, Grace family. Hey, Grace. We are here at our house with our newest addition. Guys, who who is this? Baby Daniel. Baby Daniel. <laughs> who, when, when was he actually born, babe? He was born on, <laughs> he was born this past Wednesday, April 28th. How big? Um, was, uh, he was eight 40... pounds, 11 ounces, and 21 inches. That's right. And yeah. so, so baby's okay, mom is okay, resting up, <laughs> going forward. And uh, we're just so thankful and grateful to you guys as our faith family show. Just praying for us, supporting us, encouraging us during this time. Uh, we're just so honored to serve alongside with you guys at Grace. We're trying to do our part to grow our church and to reach our community uh, evangelistically and also grow <laughs> our faith family biologically as well. And so yes. um, we have a special treat today. Guys, guess who's going to be telling people about God today? Uncle Tony. Isn't that cool? <laughs> oh, they're so blown away. And so we have Pastor Tony Sanchez going to bring us the word today. Pastor Tony, I love you. I'm so honored to serve with you as well. I would love for us to give him a big Grace Fellowship welcome after our announcement video here in just a minute or so. But again, thank you for your support for us. We look forward to being back with you. I'll be there next Sunday, Lord willing, uh, to preach at our Mother's Day services at Grace. So today, we're doing Grace online. Oh yeah. So thanks again, guys. We love you, and we look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Guys, say bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Grace. Love y'all. Bye, Grace. Love you. Good morning and welcome to Grace. My name is Tony Sanchez and we're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. As you can see, this is not the church. I'm actually recording from the beach here at Singer Island where in just a few minutes, we'll be baptizing members of our church family. This is truly one of our favorite days and we praise God for continuing to work at Grace. Now, if you missed this beach baptism, don't worry. Our next one will be on July 11th. But remember, we have a beautiful baptistry ready to go every Sunday at church. So if you're interested in being baptized, mark it on your Connect card or go to our website and sign up and we'll reach out to you right away. Starting Point is your first step to getting connected at Grace. And we're making it available in person every Sunday at 10 a.m. Just follow the signs in the lobby and I'll speak to you about our beliefs Christianity and help you get connected to a small group that's perfect for you because there's definitely a place for you here at Grace. We're excited about Grace Recovery Church coming back on June 8th at 7 p.m. in the theater. If you're interested in learning more about this incredible ministry and want to know how you can help, select Grace Recovery Church on your Connect card today. Remember to bring your mom or mother figure to church next Sunday as we celebrate Mother's Day. I don't want to share too much, but Pastor Lorenzo might be preparing something really special, so make sure to include Grace in your Mother's Day plans. We love to pray for our Grace family, so if you have any prayer requests or you'd like to connect to one of our pastors or ministries, please fill out the Connect card. You can fill this out by visiting our website, downloading our app, or scanning the QR code that you'll find in the seat in front of you. Just point at it as if you're taking a picture and click on the link that pops up. Follow us on social media at GF West Palm Beach to add some more encouragement and godly content to your daily scroll. Thanks again for worshiping with us today. Hang on tight as Pastor Jeff continues our series, Relationship Reboot. Have a great day, Grace.
case those videos confused you, I am not Pastor Jeff. <laughs> but we like to be prepared here, so obviously I filmed that at the last beach baptism, and the way babies work is they don't have a time schedule, right? We don't know when they're going to come. And so we're just excited for Pastor Jeff and his wife, Jen, um, as they're, they're just at home and they're resting, and we want them to just be able to be there for their new baby because before they only had two. Now they have three, so naturally they're outnumbered. So we want to make sure that they start out well. But hey, I want to just celebrate what you saw there, not just uh, Pastor Lorenzo walking behind me towards the end of the video there, which he did on purpose, but I want to celebrate 17 baptisms last week. Can we just celebrate that at the beach? Man, 17 people who took that next step in their faith. It's such a big moment. I remember when I got baptized. It's just a big deal. But hey, we've been in this series, Relationship Reboot. And so I want to recap a little bit of what we've talked about so far. So Pastor Jeff started us out. We talked about what it means to know God in our relationships. Then we talked about intimacy, which is important. And then Pastor Caleb, our student pastor, he talked about family and the vital role that family plays and how the way that we can be a blessing to the next generation, to our children, and others is to con constantly and continually teach them about God. And then last week, Pastor Jeff talked about David and Jonathan, friends and enemies. And I want to kind of play off of what we heard last week, and I've titled this message today, Frenemies. And so what I want to do is I want to show how our friendships, healthy and sometimes unhealthy, they really make a difference and they filter every other relationship in our lives. And it's true, whether you're in singleness right now, whether you're dating, whether you're engaged or married, or you're parenting or grandparenting, or you're just trying to be neighborly, we know that friendships play a role in every area of our lives. But before I start out this morning, for you that are in the room and those watching online, my father-in-law may be watching right now. And so I wanted to give him a shout-out. I don't know if we still do shout-outs. That's like a 90s thing. So now you know how old I am. But I want to give a shout-out to my father-in-law because he knew that at any point I could be up here because this baby was on the way for Pastor Jeff. And so he gave me some words of wisdom. And I want to share them with you because it's always great to share words of wisdom from an elder. So here's what my father-in-law told me for this morning. He said it just like this. He said, Tony. He paused. He does that. He pauses. He said, Tony. I want you to have a beginning, and I want you to have an ending, and I want you to keep it close. That's what he told me. I couldn't make any promises because I am a pastor. But with that, here's what I want to do as we think about relationships and those words of wisdom. Our friendship should be at the very top. The Bible speaks a lot about friendships. I mean, the very first friendship was Adam, Eve, and God. And we see this incredible relationship where Adam and Eve, before they committed sin, and even after, God was still involved in their lives. And he provided for them. And he was there for them, even though that relationship was limited. We see patriarchs like Abraham, who was called a friend of God. We see that the Lord, in Exodus chapter 33, incredibly with Moses, it says here in the passage that he spoke to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. We see the close relationship last week between David and Jonathan, and in 2 Samuel chapter 1, it says this in verse 23, Saul and Jonathan beloved and lovely in life and in death. They were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 15, I love what he says here to his disciples, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you what? Friends called you friends. For all that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. And here's one of the things I love about the cross. See, the cross is a relational act of forgiveness. We know that. Jesus forgave us for our sins. But not only is it a relational act of forgiveness, it's also a relational act of friendship. That initial friendship that God had in the garden that was intended for humanity is restored at the cross through Christ. And the greatest thing about that is that when that relationship is restored, when we put our faith in Christ that fuels real relationships everywhere else. And that's so important. That restored relationship, that restored friendship with God fuels every other relationship. And in 1 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it strengthens that truth. 
where it says, that, w- that which we've seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things so that our joy may be made complete. So, as I was prepping for this, as I was thinking about friendships when I was younger, later on in my teenage years, and now in my I'm a little bit older, right? I was thinking about it. I went online, and I was like, I'm going to go online because the Internet has all the answers. And so I'm going to search it. And here's what I found. Whether you, listen, whether you're a Christian this morning, you're kind of seeking, you're not sure where you're at, or you have no relationship with God, I believe that these ten truths that I found in this article, not a Christian article, called Ten Habits of People with Longstanding Friendships, I think they apply to every single person. So here's number one. Number one. Ten habits of people with long-standing relationships. You need to be a good listener. I want to stop right here. Because I need prayer in this area. Not just in my friendships, in my relationships, but in my marriage. No? No amens, guys? Wow. Okay, you're not listening. All right, we need to listen. We need to be good listeners, all right? That's so important. How are we going to move forward and have good friendships and great relationships if we don't listen, right? Right? We need to listen to what God is telling us, and we want to apply that and be good listeners all around in our friendships and all other relationships. Number two, the article tells us we need to be non-judgmental. This does not mean that if we have specific convictions and morals and truths that we get from the Bible, that we go against them. That's not what that means. That means that we come alongside someone and we understand that maybe they may not be living the way we do. They may not believe the same things that we do. They may not be doing the things that we agree with, but we try to be good listeners and we understand why they're there. And they're, guess what? They're doing the same thing with you, right? It works both ways. Number three, we need to be able to show appreciation. If we're not willing to appreciate our friends and those closest to us, how are we going to appreciate other people? This is so vital. Number four, we need to be willing to be loyal. Loyalty is so vital. I remember when I was a teenager, one of the lessons that I had to learn was, you know, when you start out in the week and you're hanging out with friends, you kind of start planning things. And you're like, hey, I can't wait till the weekend. Right? It's like Monday morning. Teenagers are like, I can't wait till the weekend. Right? That's just how teenagers are. But you're like, I can't. Let's go to the movies. Let's watch this. Let's do that. Let's go there. And then towards the end of the week, because you're walking the hallways, you're talking to people, you decide, well, I just heard about this other thing that I want to do, and I think I'm just going to go to that and not go to that first thing. And so my parents saw that I started doing this, and what they basically taught me was, is, listen, Tony, if you don't keep your word and remain loyal, you're not going to have friends that are going to stick around. And they're not going to be loyal to you if you're not loyal to them. And I remember that was kind of a sting. And, of course, my parents were right, even though I thought I had all the answers as a teenager. Um, And so I had to learn loyalty. And that was one simple lesson I will never forget that my parents taught me. Number five, in regards to having longstanding relationships, communication. And the only thing I can say to that is refer to number one. Okay? In order to be a good communicator, you need to be able to listen, right? But you need to be able to say more than just five words to your wife or your spouse. I'm talking to you guys. Again, guys, are you paying attention? All right, we need to be able to communicate well. That's important. That's vital all around. Have good communication. Number six, we need to be honest. I think that one's a clear one. Number seven, we need to be willing to make time with our friends. I mean, there's a little thing called FaceTime. There's Skype. Even if you have friends that are not living in the same area code, if you're rocking a flip phone, come see me after. We'll find a way. You'll get connected to that friend, okay? We'll figure it out. Number eight, you need to be able to handle the good and the bad. There's nothing worse than a friend who sticks around when things are good, and then when you really need them, they just abandon you. And we'll see that today in the text. That's really important, both the good and the bad. You need to be dependable. That goes without saying. And finally, you need to be vulnerable. This is a hard truth for us in the West. We need to be vulnerable with our struggles and with our discomforts, and we need to be able to tell someone what we're going through so that they can share what they're going through and be vulnerable with one another. So friendships shape us. They shape every relationship in our lives, the good and the bad. Ultimately, friendships matter. Friendships matter. And even though we don't find our identity in our friendships and in our relationships, they are still important. And we see examples of this, of friendships and foes and frenemies all throughout our culture. Just think about entertainment, right? Think about shows, right? TV shows. Maybe some of you remember this TV show here on the screen, the show Friends. It literally is called Friends, 
okay? So that's what it's about. It's about these, just a little bit before my time, early 90s here, all right? But then we go to the next one. Don't feel bad. It's all right. All right, we have Seinfeld here. It's around the same time, right? And, and these four friends, and we also have frenemies in there, Seinfeld and Newman. I don't have time to go through that encounter, but that's something that happens there. For our younger people in the crowd, or maybe you're not younger, maybe you're older and you love these guys because they're best friends, right? And Squidward comes in there and he doesn't know how to react. Or maybe a show that I love that is in my time frame is this one, The Office. Okay, this show is so good. I've seen it through a few times and we all love Michael and Toby, those enemies. They don't know how to handle each other. How about, how about movies? When I was younger, I loved the movie The Lion King, all right? Not so much Simba, but who doesn't want to party with Timon and Pumbaa? Those guys ate whatever they wanted, right? No worries. That was their motto. Do you remember the last time you had no worries or no bills? Kindergarten, maybe. That's, that's what I remember, right? I want to be those guys, all right? How about Toy Story? That's another really popular one. The Buzz and Woody. There's times when they're frenemies. There's times when they're getting along. There's times when they're not, but they always come back together, right? Because you have a friend in me. Or how about The Goonies? This is a classic 80s movie, right? Goonies never say die. This is just a classic example of friendship and trouble, and I want to find treasure one day too, right? And then this final one, a newer movie, Ready Player One, really incredible movie in the virtual reality realm, which some of you are saying, I don't even know what virtual reality is. I don't want to know what that is, right? Or how about this? Think about social media, all right, social media. I remember when I was told, hey, you need to get on social media. This was back in the day when Facebook was just for college students, believe it or not. And so I remember I was going to go on there, and I was told, okay, you need to make a profile. The first thing I thought in my mind was, a profile? You mean I have to do homework? I have to, I have to, make, I have to do this? And then I have to add a picture, and people are going to see me? What picture do I choose? Do you, listen, right now you're thinking of the word picture. You're thinking of iPhone. Do you understand what the picture quality was back then? It wasn't good. But then I, I saw that you can connect with a ton of people and college friends and all that, and it was good. But then you realize as you're connecting, listen, Facebook, did you know that Facebook wasn't the first ones that did social media? I had to think back. They just capitalized. Remember a little thing called MySpace? That was classy. Got better and better, top friends. And you could put music on there and groove. I can't dance right here. Okay, listen. My space was so cool. I remember when I was on there, I just want to thank Tom because he was everyone's friend, if you remember Tom, all right? Now, how about this one? America Online. You hear that glorious dial-up internet, and you're praying, God, please don't let my mom pick up the phone because then I'm going to get kicked off, and I've got mail, okay? And i got to chat in these chat rooms. Or how about this one? I've never heard of this one. Maybe you have. Some people in the last service haven't. Live Journal? My wife had this. And I said, MJ, what is this? She goes, okay, do you remember back in the day when girls had, like, journals? And they would fill out the journals and hide it so parents wouldn't find it. And if they did, it would say, like, mom, dad, if you read this, or, or your little brother, I'm going to kill you, uh, right? If, but this was the, the digital version of it. So you can vent online and nobody knows about it, but people that, does it sound familiar to social media today? Right? This was, like, the first one where you can actually vent online. Apparently, I didn't think I, have a, I had a computer back then. That's probably what it was. But if you think about it, any form of non-face-to-face -face communication is a form of social media, from the telegraph to the radio to the telephone to virtual reality. And my generation is basically the analog turned digital generation, which is just a fancy word for saying I'm a millennial, right? So I remember growing up as a child, I had three close friends, three these are guys I went to school with, I was on the bus with. After school, we hung out. We used to play a little thing called N64. We used to just have a good time. And then I decided as I'm, I'm going through this nostalgia, I go online and I just, you know, let me check my friends on social media. So I went on Instagram and I found out I have a total of 455 friends. And some are pending. <laughs> some of you are probably thinking, that's kind of weak. I guess I'm just a modest guy. And then I went on Facebook, which I've had for a long time. I had 820 friends. Oh, yeah, I'm connecting to all of them. Four billion, more than four billion people are on social media worldwide, half the world. But you all know this. You all know this. You know, having friends, real friends, friends that go on vacation with you, friends that you have a meal with, friends that are there when you're going through those hard times, friends that see your kids growing up or they're there with you as teenagers. Like, this makes life so much better. 
And we read this in Proverbs 17, 17, where it says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Now, some of you in the room may be thinking, wrong. I don't need friends. Matter of fact, I love COVID because nobody's got to hug me. <laughs> but you may not have time for friends, but when you go on healthguide.org, it's a foundation dedicated to emotional, mental, and social health. They've done studies, and they've noted that friendships have the power to improve our moods, and they can even reduce stress and depression. Friendships do matter. Maybe for you, maybe, just maybe, I'm just going to throw it out there, maybe you expect too much from people. Maybe your selfishness just gets in the way. Think about that. But we also know that some of our greatest sorrows, and this is part of it too, some of our greatest sorrows in life come from bad friendships. And we've had to endure that. So as adults, it's kind of hard sometimes to make and keep close friends. I don't think we live any longer in the days where maybe like my parents or like my wife's parents where somebody would stay in the same house for decades, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. That's not the norm anymore. People are moving. In the last year and a half, a lot of people had to move for work-related reasons. Sometimes people move for health-related reasons, for family, whatever it may be. And so maybe those childhood friends or those friends that you had for a long time now it's long distance, and even with the communication that we have today, we don't really, it's not the same, right? It's not the same like us being right here together and talking to one another. It's different. So naturally, we leave those friendships, and, or maybe when you were a child, you, you moved around a lot, and you really didn't keep close relationships. Think about children. You ever notice how children make friends? You ever notice it? Like a child goes up to another, another child, and they're like, you're five years old. I'm five years old. Let's be best friends, right? Or a little girl go up to another little girl and they'll compliment each other or they live next door or they're in the same neighborhood or they both have bikes, right? And they're like best friends. This is a true story. My childhood best friend that I met in kindergarten, okay? I don't remember back in the classroom how it all worked out, but it, we always talked about it throughout our lives. You know how we became best friends? I'm going to share it with you. I really believe my teacher was OCD, and so his name is Ronald. My name is Tony. And so as she was going through the role, his name came up first. And she said, Ronald Sanchez. And then my name was next. And she said, Tony Sanchez. And I really believe, and again, this is not a memory I remember, but I, I want to believe that when our names came together, we locked eyes. And we knew. We had the same last name. I mean, can't make that up. And we were friends all the way through high school. And even when he moved down further south than I did, we still hung out together every chance we got. Can you imagine doing that as an adult? Can you imagine that? You're 40 years old. <laughs> I'm 40 years old. We got loads in common. Let's do this thing doesn't work out that way, right? Like, it's different. Like, we're older. We have layers and beliefs and biases that help and hinder us. We're different people. I wish it did work that way, but it doesn't. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray real quick. And when I, before I pray, I just want to go into the text. I want to focus on the Apostle Paul today. The Apostle Paul, here's a man that was used by God in a mighty way. He had this incredible encounter with Jesus in the book of Acts, chapter 9. He goes from persecuting the church to being a spokesperson. He takes the message everywhere on these missionary journeys in the known world. He writes almost half the New Testament. He does all these incredible things. God uses his background, his training, his citizenship, and his mind, even his weaknesses, as so many people came to believe in God, to believe in the sacrifice of Christ and churches were started. And here's the amazing thing about all these truths that I just mentioned about Paul. He didn't do it alone. He didn't do it alone. Paul did not have the resources. He did not have the ability. He did not have the power to go around and complete this grand mission that God had for his life. He needed people there, sometimes people that were close and sometimes people that weren't so close or that kind of betrayed him in a lot of ways. But he knew he couldn't do it alone. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to keep going in the message this morning. Let's pray. God, I pray for this morning as I go through the passage, please speak through me as we learn these truths. And we learn from Paul's life that even in his lowest moment, or at least what should have been his lowest moment, 
Lord, he continued to trust and work in you because in his mind to live was Christ and to die was gain. So we pray that in your name. Amen. Paul didn't do it alone. Think about if you work in business or you've worked for maybe the government or a large organization. All right, here's another one. All right, think of Amazon two days, sometimes one day shipping. That's not done by one person or a few people, right? You need suppliers, you need employees, you need customers, you need stockholders, you need so many different things. Here at Grace, our lead pastor is not going to reach Palm Beach County, West Palm, and the world for Jesus Christ. One person will not do that. We want to come along, alongside together, not just our pastoral team, not just the leaders, all of us together, because the Great Commission is not just for those that may be trained in the gospel or in the Bible or have a degree. Jesus says to go and make disciples, not those that are learned or those that, may, that it makes sense to or those that believe for 10 years or those that kind of get it. No, everyone who believes in the gospel needs to go out. So we can't do it alone, and thankfully we're not called to. Thank God. Paul knew that the church was built on Christ, but he knew eventually he couldn't be in all places at all times, and he knew that his time was coming to an end. Some people in his life were real close Some were newer, some were older companions. Some people stuck it out with him and they were willing to make sacrifices while others weren't willing to do that. Some were believers until the end and some pretended and weren't really faithful. And we've all experienced these kinds of relationships. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, it's towards the end of Paul's life and ministry. He's in prison for preaching the faith, and he's writing to this young pastor that he's been mentoring since he was very young called Timothy. And Paul describes Timothy early in the book of, of, uh, of Timothy. He says that he's a son in the faith because he's been faithful since the beginning. And early in chapter 4, we see these famous words by Paul. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I hope that we get to say those words one day. And then we go into verse 9, and Paul, writing to Timothy, he says this, and there's a lot of text here, but stick with me. There's a lot of good stuff here. It says this, do your best to come to me soon. Paul's talking to Timothy. For Demos, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Demaltia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful for me in ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's point number one in our text today. Our commitment and our concern should be for people. Our commitment and our concern should be for people. After enduring so much and serving God faithfully, you know what Paul's focus was? It wasn't on number one. It was on others. We see a whole list of others here in the text. Just as Jesus prepared his disciples for his departure, Paul was preparing those that were closest to him, and he was even calling out those that were pretenders as well, here towards the end. He was making final arrangements. He's reaching out to those people that are vital in ministry for him. And he's had faithful companions all throughout, even before this point. We see people like Barnabas, who was there for him when Paul went from really taking people, putting them in jail, and probably even killing people. Now he's supposed to be the representative of the church. And Barnabas comes alongside and says, no, his life has changed. I've seen it. He is following God now. He believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Barnabas was there, a faithful friend, went on trips with him. We see Luke is with him there in jail. Why is it so vital to have Luke? Because not only is Luke a gospel writer, he also wrote the book of Acts, so it's the accounts of everything we see in Peter and Paul's life in the New Testament. But Luke was a physician. And there were times, if you ever read the book of Acts, where Paul was stoned, whiplashed, he was beaten. And who better to have by his side than a doctor? Especially when you're in a dingy, smelly old jail. 
He had Silas, close companion, leader in the Jerusalem sh- uh, church. He shared a jail cell with him in Philippi. He worked as a secretary for Paul. And time, uh, Timothy and Titus, we see Timothy here. He's writing to him. These were guys that he mentored, young pastors that were faithful to him, that were leading in the local church. So he may be in a prison cell, but you know what he's not doing? He's not sitting in a corner crying and just thinking, where am I going to go now in my life? He's saying that even though I'm in prison, you know what he asks for in the entire verses, in all these passages, 9 through 18? He only asks for two things. He asks for a cloak. Why? Because it gets cold in that area. And it's not like he was told, hey, you're going to jail now. Make sure you go gather your things. He was probably just taken. He couldn't get his things. And he knew that winter was coming. At the end of chapter 4, he tells Timothy, please come soon. It's going to take you a few months. Bring my cloak. It's going to get cold. Come before winter. You know what else he asked for? Books and parchment. I want to continue to read. I want it to continue to grow. He probably has a few Old Testament manuscripts, and he also wants to write to the churches. He wants to encourage them. And don't think he's just in a little jail cell with a little desk, and it's just him and someone else, Luke. No, he's in there probably with 20 or 30 guys. Oh, and by the way, uh, they didn't have toilets back then, right? A ton of guys in there with him. It's probably, it probably stinks. And he's still doing the work of the gospel, and he wants to see his friend Timothy one last time because Timothy exemplifies Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. He wants to see his friend. It's no different than a good parent and a good coach. A good parent wants to see their child celebrated. They're going to discipline their child. They're going to help their child strive so that they can live a life worth living and more than anything to know Christ. And a good coach, you know what he's going to do? He's going to look at the individual and the team as a whole, and the coach is going to teach and direct and do everything possible to make sure the team is successful. That's what a good coach and a good teacher does. And then from there, we see Timothy, the faithful son, friend, co-laborer, and then we go to verse 10. And Paul says, Demos, in love with the present world, has deserted me, and he's gone to Thessalonica. See, Demos was around for some time, but it says that the love of the world led him to abandon Paul. Now, I don't know about you. There's been times, and we've experienced this, where we may feel maybe unloved, or maybe we feel lonely, or we may even feel unhappy. It's natural to experience letdowns in difficult times, but when you look at this Greek word here, deserted me, this word has its root in betrayal. Like, he literally betrayed Paul. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. We don't have it in the text. But I wouldn't be surprised if maybe Demos was part of maybe Paul even being imprisoned. Who knows? Or at the very least, Demos knew that Paul was on his way to jail. And you know what he said? I'm out. I don't want to go to jail. Yeah, I love this God thing and the miracles and Jesus and all this, and I believe in him, but I don't want to sacrifice that much. I'm not going to prison for the gospel. I'm going back home. I'm going to hang out with some friends. I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Sorry, Paul, you're on your own. I love what Adrian Rogers says, faithful pastor for years, actually born here in West Palm Beach. Now he's with the Lord. He says this about having real friends. Adrian Rogers says this, if you want to see who your real friends are, just make a mistake and see whether or not they leave you. Life is like a ship. Some people get on and off board very easily. Some will stay on board as long as everything's sailing smoothly. But let the rough weather come and they will abandon ship. A true friend is the one who will stick with you. Now, we don't have time to go through all these friends who were faithful to Paul, but we have a list, Crescens, Titus, Luke, who was with him, Mark. Mark, who at one point, the gospel writer of Mark, actually leaves Paul in one of the missionary journeys. In the second one, they have a disagreement and he leaves. And Paul's saying, now, bring Mark. Mark should come. He, he can be helpful to me in ministry. He welcomes him back. Tychicus and others. So our commitment and concern should be for people. Here's point number two. Let God deal with your enemies. Let God deal with your enemies. Paul speaks of this other person. We already had Demos, and we understood what he did, where he was at. He abandoned Paul. But here we have Alexander the coppersmith. And Paul says in verse 14, he did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. This is really strong wording. The only other time I can think of is in the book of Galatians. Usually when Paul writes a letter, he's encouraging and exhorting and and telling them he's praying for them. When you read the book of Galatians, it doesn't start out that way. He just tells them, this is what you're doing wrong, and you need to change this. He's speaking the same way here to Alexander the coppersmith. He even tells Timothy in verse 15, beware of him yourself. 
for he strongly opposed our message. And you know what Alexander did, and I really believe this, he committed the very act that represented Paul and all faithful Bible-believing Christians. Paul, Timothy, Titus, whoever else it may be, Silas, were going out, they were preaching the gospel, and you know what Alexander was doing? He was going against it. He was saying, this isn't real. This is false. And that's what Paul's telling us here. He's opposing the message. Another word translated in another uh, Bible translation is he's opposing our teaching. What we're teaching, he's going against it. And the truth found in the scriptures. And then, you know what Paul does? He doesn't seek revenge or payback or find a way to get back at him. He says in the passage, God will judge him according to his deeds. Our commitment and concern should be for people. Let God deal with our enemies. And then finally, here's the last point, maybe the most important point. Lasting friendships should be led by a love for God. Lasting friendships should be led by a love for God. Even in the midst of prison, betrayal, loneliness, and imminent death, Paul was quick to forgive. Is that the same for us? Like, are we, like, we're, we're so easily, and I'm guilty of this too, we so easily fall into the temptation of when we're, we're uncomfortable, we have some kind of discomfort, we just kind of abandon ship. It's just not worth it. I mean, we do that with temporary things and material things, but how often do we do that with people? Like people. And Paul here, in verse 16, he says this, At my first offense, no one came to stand by me. No one. And he was giving a defense, probably for this very time here when he was in prison, or maybe one of the other times, he says, nobody stood by me. All deserted me. Abandoned him. And then we see shades of the cross of Christ when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He says this, may it not be charged against them. They don't understand. They don't understand. So Paul had some faithful friends and relationships and some unfaithful ones. And the most important relationship for Paul was his relationship with Christ. My goodness, it's all over 17 and 18, verses 17 and 18. I mean, re, I mean, underline that. If you have a Bible, just highlight this part. Paul says nobody stood by him from a human perspective, but in regards to the Lord, he says in verse 17, the Lord stood by me. Who else do you need but God? He stood by me. He strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. And all the Gentiles might hear it. And then he says this, and I love this. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. I was rescued from the lion's mouth. I was rescued from the lion's mouth. And then in verse 18, we see this, this grandeur of worship. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. Whether I live not for Christ or whether I get killed, guess what? God was standing with me when I was all alone. And when I die, I'm going to be standing right next to Christ in heaven. Right there. Doesn't matter which way. And then he should have added a few more forevers and amens here. To him be the glory forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Because in every relationship or friendship, the goal is to make much of God. That's the goal. Another Christian writer says it this way. Christian friends link arms together with the goal of pushing each other toward the wellspring of Christ. That's the goal. So before we close, ultimately... Godly friendships reaffirm the gospel. I mean, we see it throughout. Here's a few ways that we see that, six ways that godly friendships reaffirm the gospel. Here's the first one. The gospel allows us to extend forgiveness. We talked about that. That forgiveness that Jesus offers us, guess what? We can now offer that to others. We don't save people, but you know what we do? We come alongside them. We show them how our lives have been changed. We show them that it doesn't have to be the way that they think it has to continue to be and they keep struggling and going through it. My goodness, I think we see it the most sometimes with our own families. And we know that they're struggling and they're going through things. Or maybe you're in the room right now and you're like, I'm still going through things. I don't understand. What do I do here? I don't know if God can help me. And yet has someone extended forgiveness to that person because of the forgiveness that was offered to them? We can extend forgiveness to others, real forgiveness. Number two, Godly friendships reaffirm the gospel because it's others-focused. What would this world look like outside of the gospel? Because we struggle with this in America, too, when it was, if it's just all about me. And it's just me and me and me and me and me. I mean, I think about marriage. For you that are, maybe you're on your way there, you desire, or maybe you're, just, you're not so sure. Just think about the fact that there's those times in my life with my wife. Okay, when there's times when I know I'm selfish, I know I'm being selfish, and pray for me, my wife's probably watching, and I love you, honey, but it's true, and I get selfish, 
But then there's those times when I'm actually focused more on her, and it's so countercultural where I actually say, you know what, I'm going to serve her. I'm going to do things for her. And then you know what she does? And she does this way better than I do. She gives, and she gives, and I want to give. And, and then you know what's crazy? It's like the best day ever. And then I tell myself, why don't I do this more often? Why do I make it so hard? My flesh gets in the way, my struggles, and my background, and my upbringing. And it doesn't have to be that way because I remember that I can extend forgiveness because of the forgiveness that I've been given, and then I can focus on other people. That's what healthy relationships look like and friendships. Number three, we get to rejoice and mourn together. Boy, if life is just all about me and what I can do, how can I ever do that? How are you going to ever really rejoice and mourn with someone? Because it's real easy to say, you know, I'm going to stick around when it's easy. But then when you're on that other side of the equation and you're struggling and you have nobody to rejoice and mourn with you, what does life look like for real? We get to rejoice with people because of what is going on in our lives and whatever that may look like, especially when we have a relationship with God. And then there's times when, guess what? When you become a Christian, I don't know about you, raise your hand, things get harder. But they're so much sweeter. We get to rejoice and mourn together. Number five, excuse me, number four. We get to really show, because we can extend forgiveness and we're others focused and we rejoice and mourn together, we get to really show real compassion and kindness. See, it's one thing to tell someone, oh, I get it. Or kind of, t- t- you know, and you've done this and I've done this, you know this is true, when you, when you kind of like, you're like fake kind, right? You're just kind of like, and I think this is a southern term that I heard from one of our pastors here, when somebody tells you, oh, God bless their heart, right? That's like a southern term, or bless their hearts, right? Like fake kind. But when you actually get to show real compassion and kindness to someone, where they actually see that, like, you're, you're hurting. I think of the story of Jesus and Lazarus. And before he even rose him from the dead, because that's what he does. He brings him back to life. You know what he's doing? He's there. He's showing compassion and kindness to his sisters, Mary and Martha. He, he's, re, he's not rejoicing. He's mourning. There's been times when he was really, or he's been really close to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and he was rejoicing with them. And now it comes to the point where he's mourning, and he's compassionate, and he's kind to them, even to the point where he's actually crying with them because they lost their brother. Number five, we're able to, because we can extend forgiveness where others focus, rejoicing and mourning, compassion and kindness, we can actually really listen and carry burdens together because it's real. We can actually listen to what someone's going through. We're rejoicing with them at times. We're mourning with them. We've, we've actually had a healthy friendship that's come out of the gospel, and now we can really listen and carry burdens together. And that matters. And finally, number six, we keep one another accountable. Accountability, like friendships, I think is a lost art. To have somebody there and saying, you know what? Man, you messed up in this area. You know what? I wouldn't have said that to her. You know what? I think you need to go back and maybe retrace your words, your steps, your decision. You know what? You may be older than they are, but I, I, I think that you made a mistake. We we're able to keep each other accountable, and that's what the gospel does, and that's what we can do. So here's what I want to do as we close out now, as we're going, going into the afternoon. We're going to take communion together, and hopefully you have those little cups. If you haven't gotten one, we have them there in the back. And before we take it, I want you to really take a moment to think about what we've spoken of, and, um, and make sure you don't baptize your lap as well. Open it up the right way. Um, but let's take a time to really reflect on that forgiveness that's offered to us, that forgiveness that's been extended to us that we can extend to others. We're reminded with the body and blood of Christ what he's done for us, and we continue to celebrate that because outside of that, I don't see any other hope. I don't. We believe that the Lord suffers for believers in Jesus, for those that have repented of their sins, for those that have believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. If you have children and they haven't been baptized, we encourage you to have them wait until they've made that decision. Use this as a teachable moment for them. If you're a member at another church and you're here today as our guest, we invite you to take communion with us. That's incredible. So let's take this moment now as Pastor Lowe leads in this time of reflection, and then we'll take communion together.
Your innocent life paid the cost. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Oh, Lord, Lord, change me like only you can. Here with my heart in your hands. Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. This world is dying to know who you are. You've shown us the way to your heart. Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. Oh, Lord, change me like only you can. Here with my heart in your communion together. Prior to his crucifixion, Jesus met with his disciples to share the Passover meal. And during the meal, he took the bread and he gave thanks for it. As he broke it, he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus took the cup and he told them that he wouldn't drink from it until his kingdom comes. And he also told them that this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Friendships are so important. How we make them, how we keep them, that's the hard part sometimes. But I'm thankful that we have an example in Christ. He shows us what that looks like. He shows us that it's fueled by him. And even in those times, even in Paul's life where he struggled with some of these friendships, he still went to God. He told God not to hold it against them, and he asked God to be able to handle it in a way that represented him. I hope this week that we can do that. If you have any prayer requests, if you have been coming for a little while now, you've never filled out a connect card, please take a moment to do that. We want to get to know you. We want to pray for you. We want to know your story. I want to connect with you. That's literally my role here. I'm the connections pastor. So if you don't fill out that connect card, I'm just going to try to come after you, okay? So fill out that card so I can connect with you. If you haven't gotten a starting point, you want to learn more about grace, you're like, I don't even know if I want to fill out this card. That's like filling out that social media profile you were talking about. Listen, starting point is everything grace, what we represent, what we believe. You get to meet some of our team, and we do it in the lobby every Sunday at 10 a.m., and I'll be there, and I would love to lead you through that. And we also do it once a month online as well for those watching online. We're doing it today at 1130 a.m. Finally, mothers, where would we be without you? Right? There should have been way more amens on that one. Mothers, we want to celebrate you next week for Mother's Day. Pastor Jeff will be back. Hopefully he got enough sleep. And he'll be doing a special message. I think Pastor Lowe is going to be doing something special. He does something special every week, right? It's all about the worship. I just come up after. All right? But make sure you come back next week as we celebrate mothers together. So bring your mother or your mother figure. Let's pray together. And then you can go off and get some lunch. Let's pray.
God, thank you so much for this time where we get to go through your word and we get to learn from Paul and be encouraged. Lord, whether we've gone through some hard friendships or we've had some really good ones and somewhere in between, we continue to trust in the fact that when we put our faith in you, there is no gray area. That you forgive us and you guide us. And we want to let that relationship with you fuel all other relationships in our lives. And I pray for those right now that are seeking, that are searching, that have questions where they absolutely want to have healthy friendships and relationships, but it's so hard sometimes. Help them to really lean on you as you work in their lives, Father. Be with us this week as we inch closer to Mother's Day and allow us to continue to trust in you no matter what because it'll be worth it in the end. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Stop the